just South African animation, it's crazy how exponentially it's grown in the past few years. And we're getting a lot more opportunities to tell our stories because people are tired of the same old stories and tropes. And they haven't seen as many African stories. There's so much creativity and so much potential, but not everyone has actual access to that. There's a lot behind it that you still need to be taught. It's not something that's just intuitive. I always recommend that people start out freelancing because then you get that professional experience, even if someone doesn't want to hire you full time. So the series and stuff that you're watching with really bad special effects is because they didn't have the budget for it. The, the water paint like exactly. reacts to emotion yeah. whenever she's angry, happy, or you see that like animation kind of bring the emotion and the narrative to life. Yeah, yeah it's actually a very good example. But, but, um, God, um, God, um, God. Ladies and gentlemen, guys and girls, welcome back to another installment of the Vatim God Podcast. Each one, teach one. And it's your boy, Tsepo from there. We got my boy, KG, in the back as well. He's our anchor. And today we have a very, very, very special guest. She's an animator, graphic designer, illustrator. She works in uh, motion director, 3D generalist, virtual reality. The list goes on. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you Robin Daly, hey. a.k.a. Robin O. How are <laughs> you, ma'am? Good, thanks, and you? I'm all good. So um, before I forget to mention, she's also an event MC as well. You recently hosted an event, ma'am. Can yeah. you tell us a bit more about that event and how it got to you hosting the event? Well, it was for the Cape Town International Animation Festival. It's one of the biggest animation festivals like in the country. And yeah, they just, I've worked with the person who put me forward. I've worked with them before doing sponsored videos and stuff for my YouTube channel. And she just, yeah, she thought I would be really great for it. So she asked me if I'd be interested, spoke to the festival organizers and yeah, then I was the MC for the festival. That's so cool. So my understanding is the event happens at Comic-Con, right? Yeah, it's sort of in association with Comic-Con. So yeah. at the same venue, but it's not at the actual Comic-Con. And just with that, like, what is your what is your impression really of how how far Comic Con has got? I think this was their fifth or sixth event mm. in SA. I think their first one was like way back in the day, but here in SA it was a fifth one. And just what's your feeling around like Comic Con and where they are right now, like in in South Africa? I think it's really awesome. I went to the very first one, and it was really small, but it had a lot of potential because there used to be similar festivals, but like for anime and like other subcultures, but not something for like comic-con and everything combined so i think that was it was really cool that it finally came to south africa because we used to be jealous that we didn't get it here so it's really grown a lot and there's so many people now that flock to it it's crazy yeah yeah that's pretty cool man and i feel like this conversation for me today is really to just deep dive into what animation is but i want to take it a few steps back right so uh, I understand that you first started in 2009 with your studies. Mm -hmm. I think you were at the City Varsity. Yes. Can you tell me more about that experience? Like, how was it like? I think you were studying animation there. Yeah, animation and new media. So yeah. it was good. It was three years for an advanced diploma. Um, it was actually really hard. I remember the one time I phoned my mom crying and I was like, I can't do this because we were learning rigging and it's technical. And I just felt like there was no way that this could be my career. But I pushed through and I'm glad I did, obviously, because I'm still doing it so many years later. I don't even know how many years, 13, 14 years or something. So I'm glad I did it. But yeah, it was it was a bit tough at the time. I hadn't realized what I was actually getting myself into. I yeah. didn't realize how tough animation would be. Yeah. Yeah. Would you say there is like any any specific moment or like any kind of inspiration like that led you to start animation? Well, I've always really liked Tim Burton, like his movies, and The Nightmare Before Christmas I was obsessed with, which is claymation, and obviously I don't do claymation, yeah. but just the fact that animation is such an amazing and varied art form, there's so many different branches of it, there's stop motion, claymation, there's even sand animation, 3D, 2D, there's so many avenues you can go down and so much potential, so that really, that interested me a lot about it. And the challenges you experienced, you, you, you alluded to it a little bit, but can yeah. we go a bit more into that? So it can be very technical. Um, there's a lot, you know, behind the scenes, especially if you're a generalist like I am. So I don't only animate, I also do rigging and modeling, texturing, lighting, rendering, all of that stuff. So it can get quite technical and I never really thought of myself as a technical person. I used to actually 
I would like bunk computer lessons because I hated computers. They freaked me out. I was so sure I was going to break them. People actually still have a joke about me and technology because it always screws up if I'm near it. Yeah. So I never imagined that I would spend like 12 hours a day or something sitting in front of a computer. But yeah, there's a lot of challenges, but there's also a lot of fun. What is, what is rigging? Are we talking when uh, a construction company and then you make those models or is it something else? So rigging is when you basically create the bone structure of the character. So obviously you need something to move them. So you have the model, which is just the geometry, and then you create a rig, which is a skeleton with um, things that are linked to other things so that, you know, if you move the shoulder, the rest of the arm moves with it, that kind of thing. So it's basically the skeleton, yeah. And then what is also a uh, generalist? You, you mentioned that as well, like it was one thing you, you found tedious. What yeah, is that? So, so I'm a generalist, meaning I don't focus only on animation. I do every step of the process because, you know, you can be an animator and you just, not just, I'm not like saying it's, you know, but you move the character and you animate them, but you don't do rigging or you don't do modeling and texturing and everything. So you can focus on one thing. You can be a person who focuses on lighting or you can be a 3D modeler, but I'm a generalist, so I do all of it. What array of like, I guess, disciplines or professions are in animation and can you break them down for me? Oh, there's so many. There's, 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 <laughs> there's a lot. So many. Yeah, like I mentioned, there's like all the different avenues of animation. Yeah. And then there's the rigging in every step there. There's yeah. storyboarding, you know, yeah. so there's so many that go into animation. Can you give me like maybe a top five? That's okay. Top five. In well, not top five, <laughs> just like, just list like maybe five of them and just give me a brief like um, breakdown of each. If that makes sense. Okay. So yeah. you've got motion graphics, which I also do. Um, that's mainly like you working with like 2D designs and putting motion to those, um, a lot of text animating and stuff. It's usually the kind of stuff you'll see in like stings or a lot of adverts, infographics, that kind of thing. So there's motion graphics. You can also combine that with 3D. So obviously like product animations and stuff, you see a can spinning around in water spraying off it and then the text flies in. So that's motion graphics and 3D animation. You can just have 3D animation by itself or 2D animation, like just flat cartoons. Um, like I mentioned, there's sand animation. You can do clay animation, claymation. Yeah. Yeah, Tim moving Burton. the little, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Moving the figures and taking a photo each time you move it. Um, and then, yeah, if you break that down further, then there's riggers, there's modelers, there's the illustrators who design the characters, character designers. So they don't even do the 3D modeling. They design the initial character that you'll then model off. There's, there's a lot that goes into it, yeah. I think your time there was very, very like didactic. So like, here's you now then leaving Varsity and then you started freelancing. I think freelancing is a very like, <laughs> it's a very nuanced thing. Like it's a lot of, it's very challenging. A lot of yeah. things that happened there. So what can you tell me about that period of time? I think between 2011 and 2012, when you were freelancing, like what kind of projects were you on? Which clients were you working with? How was that whole like experience for you? Um, it was pretty nerve wracking, um, obviously. So the thing is, when you're a junior, and I think everybody has this in every industry, nobody wants to hire a junior. They want like somebody who's going to get paid junior rates, but they have five years of experience. So it's very difficult to break into it, you know. So I always recommend that people start out freelancing because then you get that professional experience, even if someone doesn't want to hire you full time. So that's why I went into freelancing. I started initially on like job sites, working with US clients. So I would do just like little jobs, like modeling and stuff. I worked on a card game for a client in the US where I was making the 3D models for each of the cards. You know, kind of like, um, what's that game that people play? I can't remember now. Solitaire? No, it's got like 3D characters like Warcraft. No. I don't know, I can't remember what it's called, but yeah, you've got a different character on each card with different attributes and powers and stuff. So it was, that was one of the first jobs I worked on. Also like logo animations and stuff. They're fairly simple. So I did a lot of that kind of thing to start off with and get some experience there. And then once I had enough experience and I could put it on my reel, then I targeted companies here in SA. And then I started freelancing yeah, for people here. Was it all like like calculated or were you just like going with the flow, like things were just happening? Or would you say that you did take like a few steps back and say, okay, I'm going to plot this journey for myself and I'm going to, so was yeah, that the no, case? I definitely had to plan because like I said, it's very hard, especially with animation. 
and it was quite a small industry then, it was very hard to break into because you've got all these animators who need a job, but there weren't that many jobs available. So it's very hard to get into it. So I did plan to be able to get that experience. I would need to do the small freelance jobs for, you know, cheaper than what you would like to charge, but you need that experience. With that being said, like, how do you know what's your worth? You just went to school and now you're going to freelance. How do you know I'm going to charge this? Even if you wanted to work for free, so to speak, but how do you know how much am I worth? Like, how did you know what to cost later on? Well, I looked at first what the minimum like hourly rate is for a person working. So I would work out, you know, roughly the amount of hours that I would spend on something and then just add a little markup for equipment and things like that. But, you know, a lot of the time, you have to just actually cut your losses and charge a very little bit, especially at the beginning. So you kind of also have to try and figure out where the client has, is at and what their budget kind of would be. If it's just a single person who's trying to start a company and they want a logo, they're not going to be able to pay you much. Yeah. So you do have to sort of be intuitive there and see what the client could possibly afford to pay. Cool, man. And then you eventually found your way to Manmade. Mm -hmm. How did you find your way to Manmade? Um, I can't remember exactly. I don't know if I saw a job posting or I must have, yeah, online or something like that. And I tried at a few places and not had much ex success for like a full-time job. So I was still freelancing at that point. And I applied just for like a freelance position. And I did that and my contract ended and they decided they wanted to keep me on. So that's what happened. And how has your experience been there? Like, what have been like some of the most like, I guess, I guess, key experiences and key projects you've worked on that you feel shaped and molded you into, you know, the person you are? Because you've grown substantially at Manmade. You, she's currently um, a co HOD for animation at Manmade. So, getting to that point, like, what do you think molded you? And I guess any significant projects you worked on at that point that led you to where you are today. Yeah, I think I'm very lucky at Manmade. Um, they're very open to you trying different roles to try and see like what you like to do, where you might have talents that you didn't know. So I got to experiment a lot. I got to direct some things. I got to write some scripts. And that was all very cool for me because I do enjoy directing. So it's really nice that they give you the opportunity there to grow yourself in other avenues, not just in your specific field. So I think that definitely helped me a lot. Um, and I learned a lot just from doing that. There's a lot of projects. I mean, I've been there 11 years. There's yeah. so many projects. I remember the ones where we're pulling all nighters all together. And while it's shitty, can I say that? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Feel free to, yeah. It kind of uh, builds like that team feeling because we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that I recommend or anything, but you know, that was, it can be fun in some ways. Um, but yeah, we've worked on really big projects for clients. We're going more into the VR stuff now, which is really cool. I like being able to experiment and try different things. So that's another thing that I like about Manmade is that they're open to experimentation and like pushing the boundaries and stuff. Tell me more about directing. It's something interesting that I'm learning about you right now. Um, what really, what about directing did you find interesting and exciting for you? I like that with directing, you sort of bring in your own vision and creativity, you know? When someone's directing you, you have to do what they're telling you. I mean, you can always give your opinions and stuff, but essentially they're the one calling the shots. And I like to, you know, put my creativity out there a lot. Um, I like to have that sort of control over the project. And I also, I, I considered being a creative director at, you know, at a point in my life. So it's nice being able to spread my wings a little bit in that aspect, but not commit fully to it because I still really enjoy animation. Pretty cool, man. And then with, because I find, I, I get a sense that you're, you're an all-round artist, to be honest. I think when I was doing a deep dive on like getting to know you a bit more, I saw like you have a lot of outlets of creativity. You know, you, you always find some, some way or some new avenue to express yourself. You know I mean, so having said that, like your website, when did that come about? Like when did you start like, commissioning yourself out there to the world like okay i'm this person that can do this very well and you opening up to the world like if you need anything let me know like when did that get set up for you and um, that was back when i was freelancing so i knew that having an online presence is extremely important in this digital age and i also just got interested in building websites and stuff so i built some websites for clients and then That's i decided cool. to build my own because i could and i was pretty interested in seo and just trying to optimize it as much as possible 
and it was just for fun initially and you know i just wanted to get my presence out there so yeah please tell us what's seo search engine optimization well, what is that so you know like google's a search engine you need to optimize your site to whatever you're putting out there so that you come up in searches like higher up on the list so it's things like using specific keywords and the readability of your site and stuff like that yeah yeah i think having said that now um i think stepping a, a, a little bit back from man-made you also wrote a book um i think in 2019 yeah i think the book was ava in the clouds yeah, yeah. how did that come about I just like to do things. I like yeah. to try new things. I like to push myself. I've always wanted to write a children's book. I also considered being an illustrator at one point. I've done illustration jobs and stuff, so I've branched out into that. And I really love writing, so I just wanted to do a children's book. Um, it was right before I had my son. So, yeah, I was just in that zone of, you know, knowing that I've got a kid coming, wanting to do this. It felt like a good time just to do it, so I did it. So was it more in honor of them coming? So you'd have like a physical like document, maybe you could read it to them. Yeah, exactly. I wanted <laughs> yeah. to be able to do that, yeah. And tell us about Ava. Who is Ava? What what brought about the concept behind the book? Well, I actually um I didn't know that I was gonna have a son. I thought I might have a daughter. Oh, okay. And I've always loved the name Ava. Yeah. So I actually wrote that oh. book before I knew that I was having a son. Yeah. And yeah, that's where that came about. And what happens in the book? Can you disclose that or you'd rather people yeah, get no, the book? Yeah, no, 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 sure. Um, yeah, it's about this little girl. Um, yeah. She uh, ends up in the sky somehow in the clouds. Um, she picks up this glass ball that she sees fall down and it transports her into the clouds. So that's why it's ever in the clouds. She chills, you know, she's vibing in the clouds. <laughs> and then she sees the glass ball fall from a spaceship. And then she meets a little cute alien they make friends, and it helps her get back down to earth, basically, yeah. That is otherworldly, out this world. That's crazy. It almost sounds, I get the sense that animation kind of gives you access to other worlds. Definitely, yeah. Would you say it's, for you, like a form of escapism, maybe? Absolutely, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. It's pretty cool, man. And then your YouTube channel, like, your videos are very interesting. Like, it's like industry insights. You, you give people tutorials on various things. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so I actually started the channel um, because I felt like, especially when I was first starting out, there weren't that many resources, especially like relatable resources with real world examples and from somebody who's in the industry but not necessarily working at Disney or Pixar because where I'm at, a lot of people are at and that's not talked about as much. It's very much glamorized by like working on films and stuff like that, but there's so much more to animation and so many more possibilities. So I wanted my channel to be out there to be able to help people coming into the industry, people who potentially wanted to get into animation and also people who can't afford to actually go to an institution or pay for online courses or something like that. So that's why I focus very much on skill and career development because I wanna be able to help people, especially here, you know, there's so much creativity and so much potential, but not everyone has actual access to that. So putting it online, making it free, it helps people. Speaking to that, like um, when you go to school, if you're doing, I see you did uh, the graphic design as well as the animation. So what happens in these colleges or the varsities? Are they learning systems what in, what kind of education goes there are we learning the software to use it or yeah yeah so you'll learn the software you'll also learn like basic steps to well at least at my college because i wasn't specializing i was a generalist so we would learn things like script writing and you know all the different the modeling and all of that stuff to know how to create an animation on our own but we also did like art study and film study just so that we'd have a well-rounded knowledge of everything. So when you say words like escapism, you wrote a book, and then you mentioned Disney and Pixar, like you triggering me. And I, I wanna ask like, is there an era of like animation, and we're talking just straight like TV animation or film, do you have an era, a favorite era of that? Like I'm of, loving of anime, this era. This era, okay, yeah. please tell me more because everything's getting quite um, influenced by graphic novels and comics and stuff in the style. If you look at like Into the Spider-Verse, even the Peanuts movie, everything like that, they're taking a lot of inspiration from 3D 
and graphic novels, which I also absolutely love graphic novels. I love the style and the treatments. I love seeing that brought into another art form like 3D animation and matched together so well. Even like with Arcane, you can see the brush strokes on the characters, but it's 3D animation. And it's just so interesting to see that and how the art has developed and become something so unique now. I love you mentioning to the Spider-Verse because I think the second movie kind of like exploded more of that concept because like we get to go into Gwen's universe yes. and you see how like the, the water paint like exactly. reacts to emotion. Yeah. Whenever she's angry, happy, or you see that like animation kind of bring the emotion and the narrative to life. Yeah. Yeah, it's actually a very good example. My favorite era was the Disney, like I think the heyday of Disney, like yeah. the 90s, yeah. Lion King, Hercules. That was yeah, that, that was, was my good. era. I <laughs> love that era. Um about like Disney and what, but in South Africa, do we have those? Because when I was young, I actually thought Lion King was all made in South Africa, South African voices, but then it broke my heart to know that yeah. not really. So are there more movies or and cartoons for South Africans as well? Definitely, yeah. So recently, um, I can't remember which platform it's on, but Kizazi Moto just came out, I think it was last year or something. And that's sort of like an anthology from different African studios. They each did an episode. And um, there's a lot coming from Triggerfish as well, 3D animation stuff. They do 3D films and they are watched the world over. They're really successful. They make amazing stuff. Also, there's um, a 2D series that just came out now, Twende. And um, there's a lot coming out of Africa now. It's, it's really awesome. Where can people find that? I think maybe part of the frustration from South Africans is there is all this great content, but then how do we how do we find it? Is it on streaming platforms? Is yeah. it on so which streaming pl platforms can like um, the audience like just go and look for that content? Well, I think Twend is on Showmax. Kizazimoto was on Netflix. I don't know if it's still on because it was like a year ago or something that it came out. And then Triggerfish, it's it's movies. You can literally go to the movie house and watch their movies that come out. Yeah. Okay, cool, man. All right. And then um, I wanted to ask you as well. I find animation is the building blocks to other industries. And I think I want to segue that conversation from earlier where you were at Comic-Con into now gaming. Like, what are your sentiments on games being developed in, in South Africa currently? And what is animation's hand in bringing those games to, to life? So I wish the gaming industry here was a little bigger. There's not that many well-known studios. I mean, one off the top of my head is Free Lives. They make really awesome games but they do market a lot to the US. I think because there's just, there's a bigger market there. Um, it's still quite small here, the industry's small, but it's definitely growing, it's progressing, which is really exciting. And then Africa, so we're talking South Africa, but what about Africa abroad? Do you know of any anything happening there, like other countries in Africa by any chance? I haven't really heard about anything games-wise coming yeah. out of Africa. There's other animation content, yeah. but obviously, I mean, there could definitely be, and I just haven't come across it. Sure. Yeah. And now that we're talking about like just outside of South Africa, I'm curious to know how did your so Robin had a a live interview with uh, Harvey Newman. He's a UK based influencer, and I wanted to ask you how did that live interview come about? Like, how did you get in touch with someone from that side? He just hit me up. Yeah, like came into my DMs, asked me if I would be interested on Twitter. Um, obviously, because we watch each other's content. And yeah, he was interested in what I was doing and he asked if I would be willing to do an interview. Yeah, that's pretty cool, man. I'm all done for that one. And again, I said, like, I feel you're an all-round artist. Like, I looked at some of your sketches, your illustrations. I feel they're very, very amazing. And would you ever consider being, like, a actual, like, painter one day? Or just, and would you, would you maybe consider, like, um, what's the word again? showcasing not showcasing per se but like um exhibiting your work would you consider one day having an exhibition of your work yeah absolutely um yeah. i actually i wanted to do a ba in fine arts i really loved fine art initially before i got into animation but um, my mom didn't think that i would make much money or have much of a career in that because it is very hard you know to be a professional mm. painter and actually make a good income from that is very very difficult mm. so I thought about it and I thought, okay, I need a more solid career that'll be a little bit more stable. And animation was the next best option for me because I could still be creative and artistic doing that. So yeah. I did actually want to be 
a fine artist. Yeah. Um, and I would definitely exhibit. There's yeah. been a few times where it was kind of, I potentially could have, but I didn't have enough physical pieces and I didn't have enough time at that time to make more by the time the exhi exhibition was going to be. So I wasn't able to, unfortunately, but I, I would really love to. I have exhibited in like smaller things with a group of other artists, but it's definitely something I'd be open to and would love. Yeah. Okay. Let's talk hypothetically now. We be planning your exhibition today, right now. Where would you go? What what would be the motif? Let's just like brainstorm. What would be like the place you choose, the motif or like golden thread in the pieces you're gonna exhibit? And yeah, and why? Well, why would it be that place? Do you have any place of significance maybe or any particular kind of like style or, or work you'd like to exhibit one day? Um, so let's start with venue. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a gallery. I don't know if they're still around mm. though, um, called Kalashnikov Gallery. And they're very cool because they're like quite contemporary and stuff. It's in a really nice area. Where is it? Um, I can't remember exactly where it is. Okay. It's in one of the cool areas. Okay. <laughs> like, That's cool. Like a Melville or a Newtown. Okay, or, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe in Newtown, I think it was. But I haven't been there for so long. That was yeah. like a couple of years ago that I visited it. Yeah. But that was really cool, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like contemporary art. So it would be something very contemporary. Like I said, I'm very influenced by like graphic novels. So strong lines, bright colors. I like to use half tones and stuff like that. So yeah. it would be something like that, yeah. Okay. And then I get the sense you have an interior design like bone in you as well. What kind of motif would you go for there in terms of like just things you have there from an aesthetic perspective, like what would you want to have there? Yeah, it's also very similar to my personal style and my art style, bright colors, yeah. very bold sort of graphics and patterns. My house, yeah, it's very colorful, let's just say that. I feel like I get a lot of like Takashi, Takashi Murayami from you. Yeah. I don't know if you know Takashi, he's a Japanese expert, okay. We'll talk about it offline, but I, I get a lot of like Takashi when I, when I, when I talk to you, but that's cool. Um, I think you've given me like a full like, exp like just list of like outlets you have. What else do you do, Robin? I feel like you do a lot. Like, what other means do you have of expressing yourself? So we've spoken about you being an animator, graphic designer, um, you being a director, being a novelist, illustrator, potentially painter, <laughs> exhibitor. Like I feel like there's so much. Like you're an all-round artist. Like what else do you do? Okay, sorry, interior designer as well. Well, I wouldn't say interior <laughs> designer. I mean, yeah. it's an interest, but yeah. Um, Literally anything that I can experiment with, I will do. So um, resin, I like to work with resin a lot, resin jewelry and accessories and just, you know, things for around the house. I, I sold resin stuff for a while. I was doing markets um, and that was pretty cool for a while, but I got bored of it as yeah. I always do with all these things. I've been very much into like clay, sculpting and stuff like that. Also woodwork. At the moment, I'm busy working on a table at home, like a dining room table. Cool. Um, yeah, so I just, I do anything that I can do. Yeah. Yeah. I'm really happy you got back to clay. That was like, I feel your first inspiration. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That's so cool, man. Yeah. I just want to go back to, you know, when you start using all these softwares, because sometimes they look tedious when you're doing the same thing over and over again. Just a, a young motion is like copy and paste, but changing one little item. How, how do you overcome all those long hours just staying at a screen, just doing the same thing again and again, even though the creative be behind is different, but just the labor is the same. How do you overcome those hours? It's a good playlist. <laughs> <laughs> if you've got some like fire music to listen to while you're working, at least for me, I like to listen to music while I'm working. Some people don't, um, but for me, that's what gets me through the really tedious times. Yeah. True. And this now leads to the AI coming in. So you, I watched one of your videos and you spoke to other creators and you were like, um, I, I don't know who specifically said this, but said, no, they wouldn't replace us because we are the ones with that human emotion. You don't think one day there'll be such a code where, you know, the human emotions will be included? I mean, it's definitely possible, but human beings have so much nuance and an AI is using existing information that it's scraping, you know, from the internet and stuff. So 
to me, in my mind, that's not really something it can gather information on. There's no source for human emotions or the nuances to what people feel. So I don't feel like a machine could ever get that right. And when it comes to art, that's what people are looking for. So yes, they could make the graphics, they could make the picture or anything, but they can't get any deeper than that to something that really actually speaks to people. So your jobs are still safe in the businesses. <laughs> For now, but you always have to adapt anyway. That's the thing with animation as well. There's always new software, there's always new technology, there's new tools, and AI is a tool, basically. And with that being said, do you still think that maybe the education for the young ones that want to come up will still be important, not just to learn the tool, the AI? You, you, know, you understand what I'm saying? Like, you don't have to go to school anymore. Now I give you a PC with Adobe and uh, an open source AI. Now go work. Like, would school still be important? I think so, yeah. There's, there's a lot more behind it as well, like in theory. There's a lot more theory behind animation. There's a lot of things you need to learn about. Like there's basic principles you need to know. There's a lot behind it that you still need to be taught. It's not something that's just intuitive, you know? So, and also with the software, it's, it's very technical stuff. So I do think you need somebody to help you learn it, whether that's a teacher or YouTube videos or whatever it is. And where do you see the, the future of like South African animation? I guess animation as a whole, like in the world, in the world context. It's definitely growing so much. I mean, just South African animation, it's crazy how exponentially it's grown in the past few years and we're getting a lot more opportunities to tell our stories because people are tired of the same old stories and tropes and they haven't seen as many African stories. And it's really interesting to be seeing these and seeing things from a different cultural perspective and stuff like that, you know? Um, so we're definitely growing. We're becoming a lot more successful. There's a lot more interest in the South African industry and worldwide. There are some problems with the animation industry. A lot of people are experiencing layoffs and studios are trying to cut costs a lot. So it's struggling in that regard. And I also saw a headline about AI now being used in the new Spider-Verse movie, which is a little bit scary because some people will lose their jobs over that. Not everyone, but some will. That is a fact. That's why I say you need to adapt to be able to utilize it so that you can still be relevant. Um, but yeah, as a whole, it's growing. It's an art form that people love, people mm. relate to. Mm. It's very creative and you can do anything with animation and people are starting to appreciate it more as something that's not just for kids because that used to be the mindset before was that it was only for kids. But there's a lot more adult content coming out now which opens up the market a whole lot more. We have, you know, in South Africa, I, I know this is after effects, but hey, we, you hardly see a car getting bombed and it's like, Terrible scenes. Oh, yeah, special yeah, effects. Yeah, special yeah, effects. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's so terrible here in South Africa. Why isn't there space for you know, people like you to actually help out in these series that we see on TV? The pro There's actually amazing special effects and visual effects here. Um, there's studios that do incredible stuff. Um, but I think they are more aiming on the international market because obviously special effects and VFX, it costs a lot of money and people here are not necessarily willing to spend that money on good special effects. So the series and stuff that you're watching with really bad special effects is because they didn't have the budget for it. Yeah. And I think when I talk about the future of animation, I wanted to actually segue that into your work in virtual reality. You've been very hands-on um, a few projects um, in the metaverse. Can you please just tell us like what you've been doing in the metaverse and essentially what is the metaverse? So the metaverse is basically like an online universe, metaverse, yeah, um, where people can go in in virtual reality and they can interact with other people. They can walk around these huge lands that have been created. They can buy things, you know, Bitcoin and all that kind of stuff. They interact, they can play games. There's certain ones where you can like build houses and stuff. There's, it's basically a universe. You can do almost anything in the metaverse. You've done galleries as well, where people can actually walk in a gallery. Yeah, yeah. And you create like a real like life, real life render of the actual art piece from the artist. Like, how do you animate in that space? I'm curious. And how do you create that dynamic movement? Like, that always like intrigues me. 
Well, it's basically just like 3D animation. It's very much the same thing because you're still, you're working on all the axes, you know, in 3D space. It's the same thing in virtual reality. It's basically, it's like working on a game or something. It's very much the same kind of thing as a game. Yeah. Yeah. I think, oh, sorry. Sorry. Is it real where you, you, let's just take Uber Eats and you make it real. Do you, uh, I mean, virtual reality. Then you walk into a MD McDonald's, you buy, and then it will arrive to my door, or is it just an experience? Well, it depends. Some of them you can. You can buy a physical thing. Like we recently did something for a fashion designer. So you go in, you view the works, the dresses and stuff. You can get information on them, and then you can place an order for a dress, and the dress will be delivered to you in real life. So it depends. Some of them are just, you know, like in a game you can buy a new skin or something. Some of them are like that, but some of them you can buy a physical thing that will get sent to you. And I think for the audience, I'd just like to just um, break down the difference. Well, I don't know if there is a difference, but there is there is a nuance between virtual reality and the metaverse. Can you speak a bit more on that so people can know the actual distinction between the two? Well, I mean, you use virtual reality in the metaverse. It's it's a very similar kind of thing. The metaverse is not necessarily virtual reality because you might not be able to always use your headset to like actually walk in it. It might just be like, you know, on a game on your computer walking around, but they do, you know, coincide very much. So in essence, for virtual reality, sorry, for the metaverse, you wouldn't need the Oculus Rift, the goggles. Yeah. Whereas for virtual reality, you would need them. Yes. Okay. All right, that's cool. Um, so what's next for you, Robin? Like, what do you see for yourself? Like, um, any new projects you're working on? What are you up to now? I'm doing, uh, focusing a lot on like personal projects and personal development. I just, I like to level up just as I go through life. And I would like to just grow my YouTube channel as well, as much as I can. Mm. Um, it's, it's a fun thing, but it is something that I would still like to grow further. You know, all the best for that, Maji. With your YouTube channel, why, why don't you now post a lot of videos all the time? Or like, as we can see nowadays, we've also started. What made you maybe take a break? Or do you wait for something that's important then you post? Or... No, so I started out um, posting a video a week. And that is so intensive and so much hard work. Like I was literally every spare amount of time I had, I was working either writing a script then on a Saturday, I'd have to film. Then I would have to edit it down and do all the like motion graphics and stuff that I'd like to put in. And it was just taking up so much time away from my family that I just wasn't willing to make that sacrifice. So my family comes first and I tried to fit the videos in where I can. Cool, man. So here at Vodum Club, we have a, a sentiment or a mantra where we say, uh, each one, teach one. So... Is a particular person in the industry who you look up to and maybe we could speak to and just learn what they're doing? Someone um, that you would recommend? There's, there's a lot of amazing people here. I don't want to single out any one person. Top five. I can't. Just I can't play the first, the first five that comes to mind. I really <laughs> can't do a top five. A lot of them are like US-based animators yeah. and people who've developed their own IP and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. All right, but any last words for any aspiring animators or graphic designers or people that would want to learn more about your craft and would like to get into what it is you're doing? Um, I would say perseverance and dedication and passion are very necessary. Like I mentioned before, it's a lot of hard work and that's something you need to be prepared for, but it's also very fulfilling. It's fun, it's creative. And the sense of accomplishment you get when you see what you've created is definitely worth all that hard work. All right. Where else could people work? Because I know we we're talking a lot about Disney. Is it big corporate, just media? Well, what, what jobs are available for everybody? Like when you said freelancer, but where do they go? Where do I go? Where do I look into the industry? I think online is a great tool for finding jobs because so many people, like you can literally work from home. So there's a lot of platforms where you could start out if you're very, you know, very much a junior, um, like Fiverr, those kind of job platforms where you can either put bids in for jobs or people will contact you for jobs. You can start off on that, but I wouldn't suggest staying on that for long because you don't earn very much money, but it's good for building your portfolio. 
And then otherwise, just send your reel out to as many companies as you can find. So media companies, advertising companies. There's also companies here that do, do series and movies like Triggerfish, like I mentioned, they're in Cape Town. So there is a lot of places, but I would advise um, there's a lot of opportunity in like motion graphics and working in media and commercials. All right. Anything else you'd like to add, ma'am? Are you good? I'm good. You good? Yeah. All right. Guys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, there you have it. Another episode of Varm God Podcast. Each one, teach one. Miss Robin, I want to thank you so much for your time and all the best for your endeavors, yeah? Thank you. Cool.